church newsletter article came out this week, and if y'all haven't had a chance to read it, you really need to. There's some great articles in there, but Brother Pat wrote something in there that was part of his personal testimony, something that he struggled with just recently, but he was able to come through and God gave him victory. And um, anyway, I just thought this song was kind of appropriate tonight, D. Oh, I just started living. I found me a brand new life. It changed my direction. And it washed away all my strength. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy. This world below, I'd be covered with trouble. There'd be no place to go. But when I met Jesus, and I started believing, I got filled with His love, cleansed by His blood. I just started.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord.
confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God, the still inside the storm, the promise of the shore. I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first. The barren place beyond the ocean waves. When I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so I am not afraid. promises you made. There isn't one that is delayed. So I will not lose heart. Here I will lift my arms. And start to sing into the night. My praise will call the sun to rise. Declare the battle. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Amen. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful to be in the house of the Lord. And Pastor Clark, thank you so much for your faithfulness. The last year and a half has been tough for a lot of us, hasn't it? And I never imagined, <laughs> Brother Jerry, I love you. I, you. You said I never thought he'd be, pre I wouldn't either. Never thought I'd be preaching, never thought I would be starting a church. Never, never thought we'd be having a church plant in the middle of a pandemic either. <laughs> None of those were our choices. <laughs> but here's what I do know. I do know that, Pastor Clark, you have modeled for us faithfulness and giving. And I know this much, that the church, if you are faithful to the church, the church wins in the end. God will protect his bride. You, you want to see me get mean, mess with my bride. Oh, I, I praise God. He protects his bride. Jesus, hallelujah. 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 Praise Jesus. Mm. If you have your Bibles with you, if you could turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And again, I am, we are so thankful for the, the, the church family here, Pastor Clark, thank you so much. You, you have modeled for us a faithfulness and giving, and, 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 and we're just, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for you all and, and, and how generous you are, and we, we appreciate you greatly. Luke chapter 19, verse number 37. Luke 19, verse number 37. Verse 37 says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples. Now this wasn't the twelve disciples at this point. One commentator said that Jesus at this point had thousands of disciples there that day. It says the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But there were naysayers. It says there were some of the Pharisees from among the multitude that said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace... <laughs> He, 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 he said, they said, rebuke your disciples. He said, if, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If this multitude stays quiet, the rocks would speak out loud. Have you, have you, ever, have you ever heard the expression, don't judge a book by its cover? I'm asking you for a favor here tonight. Don't judge a message by its title. Not yet. <laughs> See, he said if the multitude stays uh, uh, silent, the rocks would speak out loud. So I come to preach to you tonight, don't be as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor <laughs> and say, don't be <laughs> as dumb as a box of rocks. Pastor Clark, could you pray? God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. Hallelujah. You are awesome. Lord, hallelujah, in Jesus, and amen. Praise God, yes, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. 
You may be seated. As I worked on preparing this message, I spent a lot of time, more time than I'd like to admit, going down a rabbit trail trying to look up the origin of that phrase, as dumb as a box of rocks. Thing about the age we live in, you can say a lot about it, but one of the things with the availability of so much information, you can look a thing up and become an expert in seconds and say something to a church like you knew it for years. So I, I, I looked up this phrase trying to come up with something catchy or practical, as dumb as a box of rocks. There, there has to be something profound that that saying came from. And as I went down this rabbit trail, all I could find were related words and phrases like unintelligent, foolish, the lights are on but nobody's home, <laughs> one sandwich short of a picnic, one french fry short of a happy meal, clueless, I've never heard this one before, sharp as a marble, <laughs> dumb as a doornail, dead as a doornail, and the closely related as dumb as a bag of hammers. Unfortunately, I, I could not find the origin of that phrase, as dumb as a box of rocks. Maybe somebody that's more skilled than I, I am in that could find out. I, I just had to give up. But when we look in the Bible, that word dumb, when we come across it, it most often does not mean someone who is unintelligent. Most frequently, dumb means unable or unwilling to speak, being tongue-tied or untalkative, being speechless or tight-lipped or perhaps closed-mouthed. And so many times even, many times even dumb isn't just talking about a temporary state, it's a permanent disability. We would not say that in today's language. We wouldn't call somebody who couldn't speak dumb. We would call them mute or silent instead. But for many years, I have been perplexed by Jesus' statement here. The Savior enters into Jerusalem on a colt. Palm branches are laid upon his path, and thousands of new followers of Jesus began to rejoice and praise the Lord for the great works that he had done. And that's when the naysayers, the religious elite, began to uh, persecute them for this outlandish response. This, this is ridiculous. You can't just treat another human being this way. They told Jesus to rebuke the people for their behavior. And as we read, Jesus Christ, who is God in flesh, he, he responded to, him, to, to them in this way. He said, if these folks keep silent, the very rocks would cry out. And we, we quote this scripture a lot, and, and me as a pastor, I've quoted that scripture a lot, Pastor Clark, but I have to stop and think about it for a moment. It's pretty contentious, isn't it? It's odd, it's, it's awkward to think about. Jesus introduces the possibility to us of rocks crying out their praise. Now I've heard people may think he was frustrated with the Pharisees or, uh, because they had a poor response of the praise toward him and, and maybe he gave them a tongue lashing. He just blessed them out for a little bit when he said that. But I don't think so. I believe that the Lord is making a powerful and a profound statement here. I don't believe it was mere coincidence. It wasn't some cliche. It wasn't some random phrase because the Bible doesn't make mistakes. It was God's purpose to deliver these words in that exact manner. It was not a manner of slang. He chose these specific words. He said if the multitude keeps their silence, the rocks would immediately cry out. So knowing this, and knowing the Bible doesn't make mistakes, and knowing that Jesus wasn't just using slang in the way many people use slang today, he meant what he said. We should stop and think about that for a moment. If Jesus is talking about rocks crying out their praise, what could the rocks talk about? What could they speak of? What could a rock say if it could speak? So if you'll allow me, if rocks could speak. The Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone. 
The Lord delivered two tablets of stone to Moses written by the finger of God. They, they served as principles on how to live morally, ethically, soberly, and godly lives. It, it, it didn't come from a man. It came from divine authority. They gave God's people the simple instructions on conduct and behavior. So what if those rocks could speak? I believe if those rocks could speak, they would testify of the God whose word is forever settled in heaven, whose word will not return void. I would think they would say, when God speaks, things happen. They would talk about the power of God's word. But rocks can't speak. There was a rock in the wilderness. It provided water to the Israelites. Not once, but twice it happened. On two separate occasions, the people of Israel had no water to drink, and, and, and they didn't have anything to nourish their bodies. And God showed Mo Moses a rock. And through this rock, the people's thirst was quenched. And I think if that rock could speak... It would say that our God is provider, that he is Jehovah Jireh, that he's where our help comes from. That rock would speak of the tremendous provision that comes from the Lord. It might say, you may not see it yet, but God is always working to meet your needs. That God would talk about the refreshing power of God's living water. But... The rocks can't speak. <laughs> there were 12 stones of Jordan located at Gilgal. The Lord dried up the Jordan River so that people could cross 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness. <laughs> and they were over. <laughs> Finally, the people of God could go and inherit the promised land as Joshua led them. Finally, the time had come. Joshua then commanded one man out of every one of those 12 tribes to go down to that basin of that river and you pick up one stone. And he, and he said, you need to put them together for a memorial for future generations. And I believe, I believe years later, decades, maybe century later, parents would take kids over to that memorial, over to that altar. And they would, they would say, you see those rocks there? Those rocks signify that God keeps his promises. But I don't, I don't think about those kids and those parents so much tonight as I think about those rocks. If they could speak, what would they say? They would speak about how God makes a way when there seems to be no way. They would talk about how when odds are stacked against us, the Lord is on our side. They would talk about the fact that God keeps his promises even after 40 long years. But rocks can't speak. There was rubble where the town of Jericho used to be. It was a very strong city, Jericho, conquered by seemingly impossible odds. Joshua led the Israelites not to some secret ballistic missile, but just to march around the city for six straight days. And then on that seventh day, they just walked around seven more times. And the priests blew their trumpets, and the Israelites raised a great shout, and the walls of the city fell. Nothing was left but rubble. So if that rubble could speak, it would testify of the power of praise. It would say that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. It would ask rhetorically, if God be for you, who can be against you? But rocks can't speak. We could think about David taking five stones and a sling to face the giant. 
Those rocks were hurled into the air by a faithful youth. That arrogant giant fell, and Israel was victorious. Maybe if those rocks could speak, they would talk about the victory of the Lord. They would talk about Jehovah D.C., the Lord our banner. They would say the name of the Lord is victory. But rocks can't speak, church. Elijah built an altar with stones during a showdown in Mount Carmel. It was an embarrassing moment for the enemies of the Lord. Don't you love it when God just embarrasses his enemies? They called on Baal. Their poor excuse for a God, little g, God. They called on Baal several times with no answer. But when Elijah prayed, God answered. The wood, the dust, the water, even the stones themselves were consumed by the fire of the Lord. So if those stones could speak, they would say that God answers the prayers of his people. And he just doesn't answer them. He answers them by fire. But rocks cannot speak. You could turn more pages in your Bible into the book of Nehemiah. And you could find that Nehemiah stepped into the picture. The nation of Israel had been divided, broken, and just finished a tenure of slavery. Many dark years in exile. The city walls of Jerusalem lay in ruin. But it was Nehemiah who God would call to organize what was left of that crumbling nation. And those men had a mind to work. They revived the stones from heaps of rubbish. One stone was stacked on top of another until the walls came up and Jerusalem lived again. And if those stones could speak, they would talk about the restorative power of God. Perhaps they would testify and say, if you've fallen and you've broken, God intends to put you back together again. The rocks, they can't speak. A woman was caught in adultery. She was dragged into the temple by the scribes and the Pharisees. And these religious leaders, if I can say it like this, so-called religious leaders, told Jesus that the woman had been caught in the very act of adultery and they, and they dared him to punish her by the law of Moses and, and demanded a public stoning on this woman. Responding to their demands, the Savior said, He that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says that they were convicted with their consciences and they, and they left one by one. But what I want to know is what happened to the stones. Hang on just a second. Let's think about it for a moment. I'm in religious indignation. (laughs) Let's kill this woman. Let's stone her to death. They dared Jesus to say it, to give them permission. They had the stones in their hands. And, they, and they're now convicted by their consciences and they left one by one. I don't believe for a second that they brought the stones with them. I know you've got to read between the lines of the Bible a little bit. But I have to think that they laid those stones down on the ground. And those stones got to have a front row seat as to what happened next. The stones got to watch the woman and Jesus. Let's see what happens next. Perhaps the rocks wondered what will he say and how will she react to that. And as they watched, they heard the conversation. Woman, where are your accusers? And when that, when that answer was obvious, Jesus said, I'm not condemning you either. Go and sin no more. And in my mind's eye, I think about those stones sitting there and perhaps watching it usually being instruments of execution. And I think if these stones bearing witness of the situation, what would they say? 
I think they would say, our God forgives. They would testify that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The stones would talk about the woman's horrible acts and say if the Lord can forgive her, his promise is for everybody. They would rejoice of the forgiveness of Jesus. But church, sorry to break it to you, rocks can't do that. They can't speak. And there was another stone. Jesus' body lay in a tomb. The devil, the naysayers, the disciples all thought that Jesus had drawn his last breath. The body was wrapped in linen as, and prepared and securing the doorway to the tomb laid a large stone. Sunday morning rolls around and the ladies came around to anoint the body and they spoke of that stone. Kind of had to laugh a little bit when you read Mark 16, verse 3. They looked among themselves and they said, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? The, the, these ladies didn't have any beef on their arms, you know. <laughs> they needed help. What, what's that tell us about the stone? <laughs> Pretty large. They said, Who shall roll away? us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher we've got a job to do this morning and when they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away for listen to this it was very great I have to ask this question if that stone could speak, what would it say? I believe it would say, He is risen. I believe it would shout and proclaim, He has power over death, hell, and the grave. I believe it would proclaim, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? But church, rocks cannot speak. Sadly, none of these stones could cry out. None of the stones could testify of the greatness of God. Their voice is silenced by nature itself. They're rocks for crying out loud. So really, <laughs> Since they can't testify, there's only one appropriate question. Since they can't cry out. For thousands of years, stones have been witness to God's power and might. His hand of victory, His restorative power, His healing, His forgiveness. They've seen it all. So since rocks can't cry out, why don't we? Has God given you blessings? Has God filled you with his spirit? Have you been healed, forgiven, restored? Has Jesus forgiven you? Are you walking in victory? Then give God some praise. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, you are good. Jesus, you are good. Oh, God, you are good. We, uh, oh, Jesus, you are good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
If you're in that spirit of praise right now, I want you to stay in it for a moment. We... We, um... Oh God, hallelujah, you are good. God, hallelujah. We, we had a guy come to church where we pastor in King, North Carolina. His name was Lee. Again, if you're in that spirit of praise, stay in that spirit of praise. Lee, I, I loved Lee. He had passion for the things of God. And the thing that I liked about Lee was he was not afraid to worship the Lord. Didn't really matter to him who was around. He wasn't afraid or ashamed to give God praise. He, he just let the Holy Ghost get a hold of him. And I saw him time and again cry out passionately to Jesus. But like so many of us, life happened to Lee. He went through a season where he was out of church. He had a very rough time. He came off and on. It wasn't the same. He wasn't faithful like he used to be. And the fact is, he was struggling in his life. He allowed those struggles to get between him and his faithfulness to God. And I'll just say this real quickly. We're living in a time where faithfulness is getting tested like never before. <laughs> faithfulness to the house of God. Faithfulness to praise the Lord. Faithfulness to obey the Lord. And so Lee was coming back and off and on to church. You know what I'm saying. He was there, but he didn't really participate, didn't really pray. And it was on a particular Sunday morning last October when Lee was in church and, and we had an evangelist preaching for us. And after, after that message, the Lord led that evangelist right back there to Lee. And he said, sir, Jesus wants to take that burden off your shoulders. And God used that man in this moment, and, and, and I watched as Lee began to cry out to the Lord. He, he didn't have to. He, he could have refused, but he began to cry out to the Lord, and he, you could feel his shoulders just getting lighter as that burden was taken off of him, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost again like he had been so much earlier. And from that point, Lee remained faithful to church up until some time later when there was an accident. And he found himself in intensive care, suffered severe brain injury. And he passed away in December, and I preached his funeral. And I preached from this scripture, this is Ephesians 5.15. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wide, wise. Listen to this, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And, and when I preached this funeral, I told the story of Lee coming to service that day and getting renewed in the Holy Ghost that day. And, 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 and here's, here's what I told the people at that funeral. I said, thank God Lee redeemed the time. <laughs> you see, there are moments in our life when God serves a silver platter before us. And he gives us opportunities. And, and that morning, Lee took that opportunity. And I, I praise God I was able to preach his funeral after he took that opportunity. And so I think about there would never be another moment like that that God set up for Lee. Thank God Lee redeemed the time. I think about Felix in, in Acts 24. It says Paul reasoned with temperance and righteousness, judgment to come. Felix trembled. He felt conviction. He felt the Lord shake him a little bit, and he answered. And, and he said, just go away for a time. And when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, I want to tell you today, connect yourself with the church. Don't miss one chance to come to church. But I also believe that applies to praise. We don't know how much longer we have on this earth. Don't miss an opportunity to worship. God may be giving you a silver platter this evening. Don't miss one opportunity to give Him praise.
Oh, God, you are good. If we could stand, if you're not already standing. Jesus said this in Luke 19, 40. He said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If you don't mind, I, I, I apologize. I didn't tell y'all. If y'all don't mind, hold off the music just for a moment longer. Get it ready. Do what you need to do. The Pharisees were humiliated by the crowd worshiping Jesus. And, and, and the thing is, they were supposed to be leading worship. They were the religious leaders. And, and, and the fact is that they had neglected using their voice for praise for so long, they forgot what it was like to exercise that, that childlike faith. Maybe it was conviction they were fighting when they said, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus, through just a few words, conveyed this truth. I've created stones to be witness of my greatness since the beginning of time. They've seen my power, my might, my provision, and my salvation. So if this crowd doesn't cry out, you better believe there are some rocks that would love to praise me. I can't keep silent. I can't keep silent. I'll socially distance. I'll wear a mask. I'll, I'll do those things, but I cannot keep silent. <laughs> so I, I, I want to show you one more scripture. Here's the reason that rocks don't get to cry out. Here's the reason. Because God's created a church to cry out instead. <laughs> All right, turn to your neighbor again. And I, wanna, I want you to say this. You might not be dumb, but you are a rock. Let's look at Scripture. Peter said, you also as lively stones. He's calling us names. You also as lively stones, you're built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I don't believe there was a mistake. He uses this exact phrasing. You are not dumb stones. You are lively stones. And then the Word of God says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Look at this, that you should, what? Show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. The Lord has made stones to be witness of His greatness. <laughs> but he's made a church to be the voice of his greatness. I'll say that again. He's made stones to be witness of his greatness. They've seen his mighty acts, but he's made a church, lively stones, to be the voice of his greatness. So our altar call is this. Quite simply, let's use that voice to praise him. Let's use that voice to praise him. I welcome you to the front. I welcome you to give God some glory. The Word of God says He inhabits the praises of Israel. That means that when we begin to praise, He becomes alive in Come us. On, yes. You may say, you may say, I don't feel like praising. Sometimes I don't either. Is that wrong? Sometimes I have Sunday service and I don't feel like praising either, Pastor. But I know this much, 
when I start to praise him, when I do it anyhow, he begins to inhabit those praises. And that spirit, I may not have felt like it beforehand, but he begins to move through my praise. And he begins to move like I didn't think he could do. And so I invite you today, praise him. Praise him. You are lively stones. You are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. Let's show him some praises. Oh, hallelujah. Let's lift up our hands. Let's lift up our voice and give him praise. We're going to take.